generative AI is here and it has changed the rules of the game. Experts like Seth Godin and Robert McKee have been very clear. The authors who are going to make it in this business are those who are writing truly amazing, knock your socks off innovative stories. The bar is that high. AI will replace mediocre writers. But at some point, everybody is mediocre. So what do you do? You educate yourself. And the good news is that there's still time, but you've got to start leveling up right away. I'm Valerie Francis, and I've got a series of webinars to help you do just that. My specialty is helping authors like you put theory into practice. Understanding the tools of our trade and being able to apply them with precision is no longer an option. It's an absolute necessity. So go to valeriefrancis.ca slash webinars for more information and sign up for the notifications. You can't afford not to. If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor, and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales, and master detective novels. And I'm Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. On today's episode, Valerie pitched Pretty Woman so that we can study character development. This 1990 film was directed by Gary Marshall from an original screenplay by J.F. Lawton. Now, of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And we'd love it if you could give our show a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Simply go to the show's landing page, scroll to the bottom, and then give us a star rating. It's that simple. All right, Valerie, how did you go this week with Pretty Woman? Well, I can hear you now saying, really Pretty Woman for character (laughs) development? (laughs) It's not an obvious choice. (laughs) But my analysis this week was much more interesting than I thought it would be. I have to be honest. No, don't get me wrong. I love this movie. This is a feel-good film if there ever was one, which is why I picked it. We're recording this episode in August, and it's got the right kind of summertime vibe for me. Now, that said, (laughs) when it came time to actually sit down and study the movie this week from the perspective of craft, in particular character development, I was getting a little nervous. (laughs) I really was. I thought, you know, that there really wasn't going to be much, if anything, to talk about. I thought I had chosen a bit of a dud. Um, But much to my surprise and delight, I discovered quite a few interesting things that, well, I mean, really, they're basic storytelling principles that are being used to great effect. That's what I discovered. But that's a really important takeaway for us. So when we say that story theory doesn't have to be difficult, we we really mean it. And Pretty Woman is an example of what we're talking about. I have a whole new appreciation for this movie because from a craft perspective, Pretty Woman is elegant in its simplicity. Phew, I'm so relieved. (laughs) <laughs> All right, I think the best place to start is with genre. Pretty Woman is a romance, and like all modern romances, it has its roots in Pride and Prejudice. I can't even count how many times I've read that book, let alone watch the BBC special. And each time I sort of get a bit nervous wondering if Elizabeth and Darcy are going to get together this time, or maybe this is the time it doesn't work out. <laughs> and that's because the narrative drive in Austen's novel and the tension that she has created and that the reader feels is masterful. I mean, even if we know the ending, like, like I just said, I wonder how it's going to turn out. That's because she's so good at what she does. And the reason 
the narrative drive is so good in Pride and Prejudice. And the reason that we feel tension each time we read it is because the stakes for Elizabeth Bennet are really high. Now, Melanie talked about stakes last season, and Pretty Woman is another great example. In Pride and Prejudice, if Elizabeth doesn't marry well, I mean, she's screwed. (laughs) There's no two ways about it. Her father's estate is entailed away from the female line. Elizabeth will inherit nothing. Now, in those days, a woman's option was to either marry well or become a beggar. She would beg in the streets for survival, or she'd be begging a relative to take her in. Now, these are very serious stakes, and that's the thing that most modern romance writers miss. And I'm not saying this to criticize romance writers at all, but it is, it is true. Most contemporary romances, or when, when I say contemporary romances, I mean ones written today. I don't mean the genre contemporary romance. What they're missing is stakes. If the female protagonist rejects the male protagonist, what's really at stake for her? She can still go to work and she can still have a home. Sure, her heart will be broken, but she'll get over that. And then she'll just date some other guy. (laughs) Not so for Elizabeth Bennet and not so for Vivian Ward. In Pretty Woman, the stakes for Vivian are very high. When we first meet her, she's the lowest of the low. She has no money. She can't pay her rent. She lives in a dump with an addict who uses their rent money for drugs. She can't earn enough money honestly, you know, through honest jobs to survive. And so she's been forced to become a prostitute. She doesn't like it. She doesn't want to do it. She wants to get out of there. This want of hers, the want to get out of there, That's called her object of desire. And it's established in her very first scene. The first time we see her, we find out what she wants. Vivian asks Kit, her roommate, don't you want to get out of here? And Kit replies, get out of where? Where the F do you want to go? She doesn't say F, but this is a G-rated show. (laughs) So the fact that Vivian doesn't fit in as a hooker is mentioned several times in the opening few minutes. It also comes up again at the end of the story, which if you listen to season three makes perfect sense. If you haven't heard season three, go back and listen to those episodes because you're missing a whole lot of really good um, story information. If Vivian doesn't get out of the hooker life, she's going to end up dead in an alley, just like skinny Marie. When we first meet her, Now, she hasn't fallen quite that far, but that is the future that's waiting for her. That's why that scene is in the movie. It's there to establish the stakes for Vivian. And this is why that big scene at the end of Act Two packs such a punch. And I'm talking about the scene where Edward says that he's arranged for her to have a condo and a car and plenty of money for shopping. Vivian walks away from it, even though it's, quote, a really good deal for a girl like her. Elizabeth Bennett did exactly the same thing. She walked away from Darcy's initial proposal, even though it was a really good deal for a girl like her. The reason Vivian walks away has to do with her character and her character development. Because the stakes are so high for her in that moment, her decision to walk away from a very comfortable life with a man who provides for her reveals a lot about who she has become. Now, these aren't difficult concepts to understand. The theory here really is straightforward. The stakes for Vivian and her object of desire are established immediately, and because the audience knows what they are, we're intrigued, we're curious. We want to know what's going to become of Vivian. So the theory here is easy to understand. Where writers have trouble, and look, I'm putting myself in the same category because I've made all these mistakes already. I really have. I am not on a soapbox here in any way, shape, or form. But where writers have trouble, you know, to be perfectly blunt, is with the imagination, with our imaginations, because we've not been taught to use them or to develop them. In fact, as we've grown up, we've been taught the exact opposite. How many people have been told to stop daydreaming? 
Well, I quite like daydreaming, actually. <laughs> yeah, I like Valerieville. It's much nicer than the real world, <laughs> real world lots of times. <laughs> so when I say the trouble we have is with our imagination, what I mean is that we tend not to know what our protagonist wants because we really haven't spent any time thinking about it or imagining what it might be. If pressed, we could, you know, list off a bunch of things that she has a degree of want for, but none of them is a true object of desire that guides the whole story. Like think about it in our own lives. There's lots of things we want, right? Like I've got a list as long as my arm of things I want, but there's very few things that I want so badly that I desire them and that they become the focus of a goal for myself and that I go after in a very focused way. Most writers also have no idea what's at stake for their protagonist. Again, if pressed, we can usually come up with something, but we haven't given any real thought to whether that something that's at stake is really powerful enough to sustain a 400 page novel. And we haven't really tested them to see if they're high enough to hold a reader's attention for the three or four months that it's going to take for them to read the book. The plot of Pretty Woman is not complicated, (laughs) not by a long shot. It's not even original. But the filmmakers found a way to add a fresh twist on a really old story. The lesson here. For all of us, and this is really important, keep the plot simple and the characters complex. Lean into the storytelling fundamentals, because if you do that, you can't go wrong. All righty, let's look at the character development with Pretty Woman. Uh, As with most romances, Pretty Woman has both a male and a female lead, but even when you have two main characters, one of them is higher on the hierarchy than the other. And we heard this in the interview that we did with Alex Sokolow. Uh, He said that although Toy Story has two leads, Buzz and Woody, obviously, Woody's the primary protagonist. That's what happens when you have two leads. One of them is more the lead than the other. In Pretty Woman, Vivian is the primary protagonist. So that's what I'm going to focus on. All right, here's my hypothesis. I think that the essence of who Vivian is doesn't change at all. Edward changes quite a bit, very obviously. But I think that at the end of the movie, Vivian is pretty much the same person that she was at the beginning. What changes is her opinion of herself. So Vivian starts out with very little confidence. She wears a wig because, as we later discover, she's not a big fan of her red hair. She's almost embarrassed about it until Edward says that he likes her red hair better than the Carol Channing wig that she had been wearing. Even the wig she wasn't sure about because she asks Kit how she looks in it. She's looking for approval. Vivian has a brash exterior, but it crumbles quickly and often. When she first walks into the Regent Beverly Wilshire, uh, she's keenly aware that she doesn't fit in and she's intimidated. When she's kicked out of the dress shop, She's, again, embarrassed about who she is and how she looks, and she tries to hide it by keeping her head down, wrapping her oversized jacket around herself, and retreating, hiding in the hotel. When Bernard Thompson stops her, at first she's defensive, then she bursts into tears. When Phil confronts her at the polo match, although she has been starting to feel good about herself at that point, she instantly collapses in on herself, and she's embarrassed again. And that embarrassment comes out as anger in the next scene when she and Edward have their big fight. This is Vivian's MO right up to the point that Edward offers her the condo. Now, she doesn't take the condo because she has the insight that it's just geography. Yes, she would be off the streets, but she'd still be his employee. He'd still see her as a hooker and he'd still treat her as a hooker no matter what he says he'll do. Because of their time together, though, Vivian sees how good life can be, and she wants that for herself. 
She didn't want to be a hooker in the beginning. And she doesn't fit in in that world. And she doesn't want to be a hooker at the end, even if it comes with a great condo. She is still the same person. Her lot in life hasn't changed. But her perception of herself has changed. And because of it, there's hope for her now. She has a chance at a better life. Now, last week I talked a bit about character dimension, which, as defined by Robert McKee, is a set of conflicting traits. Now, I am not going to argue that Vivian Ward is a deep, layered, multidimensional character. <laughs> She's not. But nor is she a flat character. I already mentioned that she's got a tough exterior, but a soft interior. That's a dimension, but it's not her only one. She acts like she's a businesswoman and she believes that she is a businesswoman. And she acts like she's in charge and she has autonomy. And I guess in a way she does, since she doesn't have a pimp, she does get to say who and when and how much. But she's not actually a very good businesswoman. If she charges $100 an hour, why did she only quote Edward $300 for the whole night? I mean, she's been with him for eight to 10 hours, by my reasoning. And why only quote $4,000 for the week and why settle for $3,000? At $100 an hour, she was worth $2,400 a day. So she's not actually a very good businesswoman, even though she thinks she is. That's another little dimension in there. It's a difference between how she perceives herself, and how she behaves. Also, I have to say, and Melanie, if you have an answer to this, I would love to hear it. I have never, ever understood in the 30 years that I've been watching this movie or however long it's been, I have never understood why Vivian didn't take the money after their fight, but why she does take it at the end. To me, the other way around makes sense, but this way doesn't make any sense. No, it's funny you mentioned that because I was thinking the same thing when I watched it this time as well. So it's been a long time since I've watched the movie, but that's something that I picked up on as well, especially after the whole point of um not wanting to be treated as a as a hooker. I thought that was it, it that didn't make sense, but at that point of the script, I think it's the only way she does need the money, right, to then go and live the future life. That is the foundation for her and the avenue for her to do that. So from a practical sense, I can see why she does, but from a story logic sense, I don't think it makes much sense either, especially because she is so aware of Edward's behaviour and how it is actually just treating her as a hooker, but a high-end hooker, not a, not someone who um, he picked up from the streets. So it's interesting that you and I picked up on that same thing. But I do think it has to be in there at some point in order for the ending to make sense. I'm thinking that she left the money initially because uh, – she loved him or something, or I, I don't know if she is such a good businesswoman and she, to leave the money behind, I don't leave money on a table. <laughs> Do you leave money on the table? <laughs> no, no, no. And you know, it, it, it's that complication, isn't it? That <laughs> when do you take the money? Do you not take the money? Taking the money is the end of the um, employee employer relationship as well. Right? So there's nothing outstanding there in order for her to come back and say, well, you never, not that she would, but you never paid me. So maybe it's also symbolic of the end of that transactional nature of their agreement, which cuts that clean and then gives them the free will to decide that they want a relationship moving forward. I, that's another way to look at it from a business perspective, I suppose. <laughs> And maybe we're just reading too much into maybe. Pretty Woman. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Entirely I, possible. I think so, maybe. But I do think, like you said, there are simple things that it does get very right. And 
you know, depending on how you want to view it, if you follow the money, that does close out and is complete by, you know, the end of the the end of the middle build of the story, which allows for the ending to be set up the way that it is. So there are some things, there are other things that it's a little, you know, the logic doesn't quite follow. But from a money perspective, I think it closes that out nicely. <laughs> I'm an accountant's daughter. Can you tell? I'm following the money. I'm very fixated on the money. <laughs> All right. Uh, other dimensions with Vivian. Well, she's a hooker who has sex with random dudes. While she claims to be a safety girl and she's got a whole variety of condoms, she's still at risk for all kinds of STDs. Yet, even though she's putting herself at that risk, she's still flossing her teeth. So, so what, is chlamydia okay, but gingivitis is not? <laughs> this is a dimension. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but it is a really good telling sign of her character, isn't it? The fact that she still wants to floss her teeth, but you're right, logic-wise, maybe... <laughs> Do you know, every time I have strawberries, I think of that scene. Yeah. Every time. (laughs) It's like, I haven't had fava beans or Chianti since seeing The Silence of the Lambs. I I can't even handle it. I see fava beans at the supermarket and I I get all (laughs) weirded out. And every time I have strawberries, I I think I I need to go floss my teeth. (laughs) Do you know, I do too. And it's what, this came out in 1990. So that is how powerful, like that is how resonant that scene is right is that we've all if you eat strawberries getting strawberries in your teeth is really painful <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh what else do i have here in my notes i'm totally losing the plot here this week all right <laughs> um uh so finally on one hand Vivian makes an effort to behave like a lady she even asks bernard to teach her uh about all the silverware But on the other hand, she's not above returning to the shop that kicked her out and rubbing the saleswoman's nose in it. Uh, And I have to say, Melanie, when I saw this movie in the theaters, in that scene, my audience cheered, they hooped and hollered, and I think audiences um, are still cheering. Big mistake. Big mistake. Big. Huge. I have to go shopping now. Uh, so there is such a thing isn't there as you do feel like that's the empathy in the in the character because there's totally. been moments that we have all wanted to do that and the fact that she did it meant that that was a release for us all cuz we <laughs> we've all been in that we situation we all got to do it with her yes right? yes that's right yeah absolutely <laughs> So that's what I've got in terms of character development for Pretty Woman. Uh, Melanie, how did you get on with your study of world building this week? It's not New York City, at least. No, true. (laughs) True. (laughs) Well, like you, I didn't think I was going to have, you know, get much from this in terms of adding to my world building study, right? Particularly, you know, that I'm really trying to look at the familiar world as much as possible. Um, but I have found some really interesting things in Pretty Woman as well. So but before I go into that, I'm slightly different in my approach. I have considered Vivian and Edward as near equal protagonists for the sake of looking at their worlds and the world building So for this analysis. So, you know, the movie is, is set in contemporary 1990 Los Angeles. So, you know, we get a, a feel for that pretty pretty quickly but then the movie starts with Edward's world so you know there are drinks in a lovely house with great views the sun is shining we meet Philip or Stucky you know who's fielding question questions about Edward's whereabouts and then when we first meet Edward he's having a falling out with his partner over the transactional nature of their relationship on the phone so they're having you know, they're having this discussion on the phone, which in and of itself is very telling, right? And then the relationship and the phone call ends very abruptly. And then Edward goes driving in in Stucky's Lotus, despite his protests, and also despite Edward's lack of driving ability. <laughs> now the world of LA is not home to Edward. 
he is visiting on business and so he is staying at the Regent Beverly Wilson Hotel for the week. Now, Edward's world very clearly and very quickly is established as one of wealth and also very clearly and quickly we get the feeling or we we understand that no one says no to Edward. And that is done through the party, like especially when Stucky's trying to say, don't drive my car because Stucky knows that he can't drive or doesn't drive and this is not a cheap car. It's quite expensive. So, But in the end he lets him do it. So it's very clear that no one says no to Edward and that is established and the world of wealth really supports that about Edward's character. Now, Vivian's living environment is vastly different. You know, the apartment where we first meet her is small, it's night time, and we see her getting dressed in her long high-heeled boots, the short skirt and the revealing top plus the wig. And then we also see her avoiding the landlord who's a bit creepy. You know, he's searching for the rent from his tenants and she then goes looking for Kit in a bar called the Blue Banana. Now, Kit's high and she's stolen from Vivian so so that she can pay Carlos, the drug lord and pimp. So we get the feeling it's a very different world. Now, despite Vivian seeing another hooker's body in a dumpster, all of her associates are really earning a living on the street and are into drugs. But it's a very sanitised version of this world and I just want to point that out from a world building perspective, not necessarily as a criticism of the world building, but more as to highlight the difference you would get in that world building if you were doing something that wasn't a romantic comedy compared to something that was more uh, sort of earthy or realistic. And it's just really, and it carries on throughout the movie. So it's, and I'll, I'll pick this up again a bit later. Valerie, did you want to say something about that as well? Did you notice it too? Yeah, even in that scene where they're driving home the point that there's a hooker dead in a dumpster, hmm. it's done comedically because they have, I got Taurus photographing the body, Al, <laughs> right? And you have yeah, Hank Azaria yeah. as the cop who has a yeah. cold. So it's done in a comedic tone. Yes. It's just like if you're writing a Regency romance, you don't talk about the fact that there's not great hygiene, that there's no indoor plumbing. We don't want to know any of that. We, we want the sanitized version. We want the romantic version. So I think when you're thinking about the world that your story takes place in, your fictional world, even if you're writing historical fiction, you get to choose what to draw your reader's attention to. Mm. If you're going to draw your reader's attention to things like the fact that there's no indoor plumbing, you're writing a very different story than something like a Regency romance. It gives the wrong tone, the wrong flavor. We don't care. Yeah. <laughs> you know? No, that's a, no, and that's, a, that's the point. Yeah, that's absolutely the point that I'm making is that you get to choose what part of how your world, your fictional world is created, even if it's set in the real world. And you and they made a deliberate choice, right, to sanitise this movie because the original script was very realistic and earthy and then when they came to make it, they changed all of this and made it more, far more sanitised. So it is a conscious decision and that's the important part of drawing this out. Like we see it's represented about and we know that it's sanitised but they're very deliberate choices the director and the writers have made. So I, I, get, I get the point there. And, um, and you know, that, that does carry through into the rest of the, the film. It even carry, carries through into how well Vivian is presented despite having, you know, lived in this environment for at least a couple of months. Um, you know, she's relatively still very attractive looking. She's very clean. Her hair is in good condition. All of those things are deliberate choices that represent uh, the sanitized version of this world. And again, it's not a judgment. It's just drawing people's attention to the choices that you can make when you're establishing your fictional world. But 
the other really interesting thing to note is that so right at the beginning of the movie, it establishes both characters in a version of their worlds. Edward is not in his home, but he is comfortable being surrounded by the best. Vivian is not home either, but she's earning a living and has her friend Kit there in the background. So there's a little bit of comfort and camaraderie there. So they are both in their normal environments for the sake of this story. Now it's Vivian who is the one that leaves her normal world and enters into Edward's normal. So, you know, she is, you know, if we wanted to wrap, you know, give a summary, she is the hooker with a heart of gold that goes into the poor little rich boy's world. And this is this is actually one of many variations of rich people being taught life lessons by poor but good people. You know, another possibly bad example would be Overboard with Goldie Horn and Kurt Russell, which also by coincidence is um, directed by Gary Marshall. And, you know, Romancing the Stone is probably also another one that comes to mind. And there are very much aspects of Pygmalion in these movies, right? This is where they're drawing from. You are bringing people up into and refining them, but at the same time they are imparting life lessons to the people who think that they are bettering somebody else. Anyway, just some things that I was thinking about, um, not necessarily world building, but things to draw from and references to use um, to have a look at if you're interested in those types of stories and the worlds that they create or are created to tell the stories. Now, back to Pretty Woman. (laughs) Both characters then, after Vivian leaves her ordinary world, inhabit the hotel and more particularly the penthouse for the week. Now, this is where most of their intimate conversations occur and obviously the physical aspects of their relationship take place. Now, even though the hotel is more familiar to Edward, it is not personal space for either of them. And this means that there's not a great deal of personal detail in the hotel room either. So if we compare this to the other movies that we've watched this season, you know, the home or the personal space have been a significant feature. In Big, young Josh discovers that he's grown up when he wakes up in his bedroom and a bedroom that he shares with his little sister. You know, Josh also, as an adult, fills his apartment with toys and games and a bunk bed. So he personalises that a great deal. And then if we compare that to Lee Israel's apartment in the movie Can You Ever Forgive Me, at the start it's filled with cat feces and books, but then by the end it looks cleaner. So if the physical space in a story is meant to deliver or give you an indication of the emotion of the character or the externalization of the emotional state of the character to illuminate that character and tell you more about it and also suggest the symbolic underpinning, then setting Pretty Woman in a temporary accommodation place does illuminate Edward's character. So Edward is a very transactional person. He is not emotionally available And despite his wealth and the luxury of the regent Beverly Wilson, he still treats Vivian like a hooker for most of the movie. Now, the combination of Edward's personality and the setting in the hotel does suggest the story's symbolic underpinning. And I'm not saying that the symbolic underpinning is deep or life-changing stuff, but it does reflect the wealth, power and emptiness in Edward's life and so forth. But the hotel is very different for Vivian. While she doesn't belong there, and it's fairly evident in the beginning, you know, with her clothes and the way she speaks to other guests, you know, that clearly shows and demonstrates that she's a bit of a fish out of water. But when Edward isn't around, you know, she's also questioned and given her marching orders. However, Bernard, who is the manager of the hotel, can't resist a damsel in distress. So he does show Vivian some kindness and then he starts to help her transition into 
Edward's world. So she has a very different experience of the hotel compared to Edward. And I find that really fascinating about how the movie makers have done that. So it's the same world, but with a very different experience between the two main characters. Now, once Bernard transitions to Vivian's mentor, she is then accepted more easily into the hotel world or the world of the hotel. But it's also another really interesting thing in this movie is that the penthouse isn't safe for Vivian either. So when Stucky turns up at the door and invites himself in towards the end of the movie, we are not surprised by any stretch that he tries to rape her. And I just... It really frustrates me that rape is used in such a trite way <laughs> as a story and a complication in, in a woman's storyline. And can I just say, if you ever think of that as your first call about how to put struggle into a woman's life, then don't go and be a bit more inventive and creative and write different stories for us because we shouldn't have to accept that that is something that's inevitable in our world. All right. <laughs> I'll get down off my soapbox now, but it's a really, you don't, if you watch this closely, no one is surprised that he does it and then no one is, um, she's not surprised by it. Edward doesn't do anything other than kick him out and it is so easily accepted and I think we can do better as storytellers than go back to those trite things that we think women should suffer through. Anyway, right. (laughs) But as Vivian points out to Edward, no matter where she goes with him, she will always have to deal with his associates seeing her as a hooker. And that is something that no matter what she does, no matter which part of his world that she enters, that is something that she is very aware of, even if he isn't. Now, I think towards the end of the movie, the reason why the story shifts back to Vivian's familiar world for the final proof of love scene is really important. So this is where Edward is the one that has to get out of his physical comfort zone. So thematically, the transition into a different part of the world supports Edward's big gesture. So if he was to do what he did, in a wealthy part or a part of the world that he was comfortable and familiar with, it wouldn't mean as much as him going down to Vivian's world or going into her world and then showing his proof of love in her world. Now for Vivian, this is symbolic of moving on from her life on the boulevard with Kit after she's decided to reject Edward's offer to be available for him when he's in town. At the end of the film, you know, she no longer looks like she belongs in this world now either and it's really obvious compared to the beginning of the film. And part of this has to do with Kit's apartment, <laughs> which is very much presented as a like a teenage girl's, right? In fact, I found it quite off-putting about how much of a girl's room Kit's apartment was appeared as in this at the end of the movie. However, as a space that Vivian is now transitioning through, it is symbolic of her outgrowing her old world and looking for a new place where she belongs or a new place to transition into so that she can start to do the things that she wants to do and get out of that life. Now, just as an interesting point, you know, if I could rewrite the ending of this movie, then I'd have, you know, maybe Vivian sneaking out through the front door and catching a bus to somewhere as opposed to running and listening and looking out the window and see hearing Edward coming. Anyway, <laughs> just something to think about if you're thinking about how to change things up. So I've looked at so far, you know, the original worlds of the two characters and then the joint hotel sort of world, wealthy world of Edwards. But then there's also a final aspect, I think, of Edward's world that Vivian is exposed to. And it can be grouped into kind of rich people activities or rich people's activities. So for Edward, 
Most of these places are extensions of his business activities. So they go to dinner with the Morses at the Voltaire. They meet the senator at the Polo, you know, and there's Philip's office. So it's really interesting, though, to note that the only activity Edward does for pleasure is actually taking Vivian to the opera La Traviata. However, Vivian takes Edward out to do fun things for a day and it's a very small venture into Vivian's world. Again, we see the story is very specific to the characters and their occupation and the story genre. Now, just very quickly, I want to go back to some of the theory that I looked at in episode two um, and I want to revisit where Swain's three key points in world building start to play out in the in Pretty Woman. So for us as the viewers, we have not been in Edward's world, right? We have not, or Vivian's world. So we see that very much play out and set up very early. And then we see that the two characters spend most of their time together in a hotel. So we really need to be introduced to and understand the world of the characters. And as I mentioned before, the absence of personal space is reflective of both characters' situation in life. But because the hotel is an exclusive place, it is weighted in Edward's favour. Now, the world is also a sensory world, So for Vivian, who is new to the world of the wealthy, she experiences this new new world in multiple ways and it's via food and drink. The sounds of the hotel are very different to those in her opening scenes. She wears different clothes, she has her hair done and she starts to speak differently. So these are very sensory aspects of the world building that, that get introduced at different times in the story. As for Edward, at the start of the movie, he doesn't have much of a sensory world. Do you know, he orders champagne and strawberries, but he doesn't drink. He travels in luxury cars, but he can't drive. He gets lost, you know, and he is surprised when Susan, his former girlfriend, confirms that she spoke more to his secretary than she did to him. So he lives a privileged life, but he doesn't experience living. And Vivian teaches him to take those moments and to open himself up to simple things in life like feeling the grass beneath your feet. And finally, the world is very subjective or the fictional world is also very subjective. And this season I've really come to understand how much the subjective world of the characters determines the spaces they occupy in a story. It determines how they interact within their world and also what sort of objects or events fill that world. In Pretty Woman, Vivian's subjective world starts in Kit's apartment, moves to the Blue Banana, and then Hollywood Boulevard. In Edward's subjective world, it's Stucky's party, filled with businessmen and women, breaking up with his girlfriend over the phone and trying to drive a very luxurious car. The merge point is the hotel, which extends out to specific events such as the polo, the opera, etc. But the hotel is the central location in the combined world of Vivian and Edward. And then they transition back to their individual worlds at the end to then be drawn together at the conclusion of the movie. So that's sort of roughly how I see the world building happening in Pretty Woman. And again, it's a really good example of how to do simple things very well, I think, and it supports the rest of the story. But again, I just want to touch on again before we close out that, you know, if you wanted to write a story like Pretty Woman but mix it up, I would look at the world and the locations within the world as a way to start changing that story and presenting something that we are very familiar with in a different way. You know, I'd put these characters in different places that challenge them, make them feel uncomfortable or that are incongruous with their personalities. Anyway, just food for thought. Right, Valerie, what are our action steps for today? I want you to identify the main protagonist of your story if you have more than one. And I want you to get crystal clear on 
what that protagonist wants. That's their object of desire. What or who is standing in the way of them getting it. That's the force or forces of antagonism. And what happens if the protagonist doesn't get what she wants. That's the stakes. What's at stake for your protagonist in the story? All right, that wraps it up for this week. Join us again next week when we discuss the electric life of Lewis Wayne. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to Valerie's Inner Circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca inner circle and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to get my tips about books to help you read like a writer, visit me on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill Author or find out more about me at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. (music) 